Hi, I'm Ethan, I love muzzleloading. Today I'm at the Rock Island Auction Company taking a look at some of the unique muzzleloaders they have in-house this week. What we have here is a documented late 17th century French matchlock musket. This musket in particular is pictured and discussed on pages 37 and 38 of American Military Shoulder Arms Volume 1, Colonial and Revolutionary War Arms by George D. Moeller. This piece actually comes from the Moeller collection and here on the toe we can see the tiny GDM collector mark. He notes this musket generally resembles the French military matchlock muskets described and illustrated by Saint Remy in his memoirs published in 1697. It utilizes a crossbow style tickler lever trigger that has the trigger acting against a spring that automatically brings the serpentine back away from the pan when the trigger is released. The smoothbore barrel is two-stage and has a simple girdle at the transition point. In his writings, Moeller indicates that the underside of the barrel have, has a sole control mark. Moeller references the multiple new chatelles of France as potential locations for this musket's use. Overall, this is an interesting piece. There's it, nothing super special about it, really, when it comes to matchlock muzzleloaders. It's just a nice indication of a late 17th century matchlock muzzleloader. What I think is neat about this, aside from it being a matchlock, is we think about this piece and a 1690s flintlock being produced at the same time. We have arguably a very slow ignition system here with the matchlock being put up against the fast for the time flintlock ignition system. And you have this kind of dichotomy of old manufacturing continuing with the matchlock going up against, you know, what was the new thing at the time being the flintlock that really revolutionized muzzle loading for several hundred years. With your matchlock, you would have your twine or your match, your fuse, be clamped into your serpentine here. We would open this up and prime our pan. You can see our touch hole here, just like you would see on a flintlock. Th this pan technology didn't change a whole lot. It just changed to be more efficient like we talk about and see with muzzleloaders and human history just as time marches on. So to load and prime this, you would load this from the muzzle, just like any muzzleloader. You'd prime your pan here with your priming powder or your normal charge powder, depending on where you were and who you were. You'd close up this pan. It's really kind of your safety for the time to make sure that none of the embers from your fuse caught that and set off your muzzle loader before you intended it to. And to shoot, we'd open up this pan, grip our trigger, and you'd see serpentine arm drops in. It would drop that lit burning fuse into our priming pan and ignite the pan. That would then travel through our touch hole and ignite the main charge, just like we see with our flintlocks and our percussion lock muzzleloaders. Much like the King William III era flintlock musket that we looked at a little bit earlier, there's no entry pipe here. We have two simple sheet brass ramrod pipes on a very plain wooden stock. There are several pins here holding the barrel together. As we go up to the muzzle here, there's an indication of how this was made that I really get a kick out of. We talked about a lot when it comes to contemporary muzzleloaders, a lot of contemporary builders trying to get a 900, 1200 grit finish on their muzzleloaders and then they're sealing them and waxing them for this ultra perfect, ultra smooth finish. But this muzzleloader here, albeit very early compared to the American long rifle, shows us you know, a little bit more of the human hand going along with the building here. Around the nose of the stock here, it's very rough and it's very faceted. And I have to imagine a knife or a scraper or a file of some sort taking strong wide strokes here at the nose, cleaning that up. Now, what did this happen at the manufacturer of this muzzleloader? Did it happen with use as this thin nose was beat up over miles of trekking and camping and, and, and moving through military formations. That we can't be sure of, but it's nonetheless still very interesting to see this kind of rough nose here on an otherwise fairly rough, well-used working man's kind of muzzle loader here. This isn't a high art piece like we can see sometimes. This is something that could have and was probably used for many years just looking at it. The wear on this nose is just a, a nice little treat for me personally.
we can kind of see similar notations of the same kind of finish here along the side plate or where the side plate would be. There is no side plate here. We just have our two lock bolts going through into the lock plate. But these edges, while they are crisp and nice, we can still see that end grain of the wood here. So they weren't going through and polishing these stocks up. They were getting them done and moving on. Even here at the entry pipe, we can see the stop cut used by the builder to establish and prevent any grain splitting from this four stock back. And that's just a really neat little piece of this that you don't see a whole lot of. When we get into using entry pipes and other uh, more metal add-ons to these muzzle loaders, we kind of lose out on these little handmade aspects that give us a little detail into how it was made. And as far as an early muzzleloader goes, this is a really fine example that still has some of those notes of the handmade craftsman behind it. Here along the tang, we can see a split out where we've lost part of the carving here. And I don't bring these up as flaws on this piece. Really to me, these little breaks and splits and tool marks make this piece all the more special. This wasn't something made and hung up and left. This is something that, I mean, albeit almost 400 years old, still seeing the use in these is, is just neat. Uh, I, I keep going back to that on all of these original muzzleloaders that it's not this super clean, done, fresh thing like it would have been quite possibly when it was finished. This has been through time and it shows. Here along the comb of the stock, we see a few more of those marks and some of that end grain that you know hasn't been worked smooth, which just makes me geek out a little bit on the traditional craft side of these muzzle loaders. And even though this is an early example of a muzzle loader, especially with the match lock ignition system, we still see a lot of similarities between this and muzzle loaders that came after it. When we look at the William III era flintlock, the stock is really very similar. We have a, oh, <laughs> here on the stock here, we have some more of those facets from the, from the tool marks. Sorry, I had to point those out. But as far as the profile goes, a lot of similarities between this and the early flintlocks that we see. It's a very thick stock, very rough stock. It's not ornate, it's not sleek at all. It's really just kind of a big brutish chunk of wood with some metal hook to it to make it shoot. And that makes the history of these all the more interesting to me. There is no butt plate on this piece. It's just soft wood like we would see in a rough Southern style flintlock here in the United States. We talk about design elements transitioning through time. This barrel is a fine example of that going from a hexagon to around here with these multi facets in between, with these wedding bands cut into the barrel. It's just a neat piece. It's a fine example of how muzzle loading changed through time and how it stayed the same. We can look at this and we can look at the muzzle loaders that came before and after and really see that line of muzzle loading history and of really industrial history as we start to see muzzle loading and firearms become one of the first huge industries that carried over to today. As simple as it is, this is a neat muzzle loader, and I'm, I'm really happy to have had a chance to take a look at this. It's not every day that you get to hold something from the 1690s and, and gawk over it for a half an hour or so. This is just a, a neat piece that uh, I hope you enjoyed seeing as much as I did. If you'd like to learn more about this or any of the other muzzle loaders featured at the Rock Island Auction Company, visit the Rock Island Auction Company on social media. I really can't thank them enough for giving me the opportunity to come and hold and look at and film with original muzzle loaders just like this one. And uh, I really hope that you've enjoyed these videos as much as I have enjoyed <laughs> sitting here with these muzzle loaders. Once again, I'm Ethan and I love muzzle loading. Visit ilovemuzzleloading.com for more information. Thanks for watching.